Buonasera, cari amici, dear friends, good evening. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to welcome you tonight with uh, our Consul General, Raffaella Valentini, for uh, this uh, uh, special program, uh, the Italian Research uh, Day in the World. Uh, as uh, some of you uh, might uh, know, uh, this is uh, uh, an initiative established uh, in 2018, I believe, by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and uh, the Italian Ministry of uh, uh, Education to uh, celebrate uh, the role and the contributions of uh, uh, Italian researchers uh, in the world. And uh, the date for uh, uh, this program has not uh, uh, been uh, chosen uh, randomly as uh, in uh, two days. It will be uh, the uh, anniversary of the birth of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who is uh, obviously, you know, uh, the, the Italian genius that uh, actually uh, put together uh, arts uh, and uh, science uh, for the first time. And so in this uh, uh, kind of spirit uh, tonight uh, with uh, uh, our friends uh, at uh, uh, ISNAF, which is the network of uh, uh, Italian researchers and scholars in uh, North America, uh, we uh, decided to uh, dedicate uh, this program uh, to uh, the broader fields uh, of uh, uh, Italian research uh, in the United States, and in particular uh, of uh, um, the fields of work of Italian researchers in the Los Angeles area. And uh, I really would like uh, uh, to thank uh, our speakers uh, uh, for tonight who accepted the invitation to join us for uh, this program. Uh, Pietro Perona, professor of uh, electrical engineering at the California Institute of uh, Technology. Martin Monti, professor uh, in the departments of uh, psychology and neurosurgery at uh, UCLA. Matteo Pellegrini, who is professor of uh, bioengineering at UCLA. Massimo Ciavolella, who is professor of uh, Italian Renaissance uh, Studies at UCLA. And uh, the moderator for uh, our conversation tonight, Marzia Polito, who is uh, a senior staff software engineer and a manager at uh, uh, Google. Um, while I'm uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, our speakers, I also uh, would like to deeply thank uh, uh, our partners as, at ISNAF, and in particular its president, uh, Cinzia uh, Zuffada, and uh, the chair of the chapter of uh, ISNAF uh, Los Angeles, uh, Stefano Morellina, who have been instrumental in putting this program uh, together. And uh, I, I would like to leave the microphone now to our Consul General, Raffaella Valentini. Thank you, thank you, Emanuele. We are already a perfect couple. I'm here just for, from, uh, from the first of March. What we we are we work very very. Uh, we have a very good uh, uh, partnership, and thank you so much for hosting me in this uh, Italian Institute of Culture. So, as you mentioned, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation promotes the international internationalization of Italian research and scientific diplomacy as a fundamental tools for the development of cooperation between Italy and the rest of the world. This cooperation is particularly meaningful in the United States and uh, especially in Los Angeles. Maybe not all of, uh, all of you know that uh, Italy is ranked number eight in the world for scientific publication. This is mainly the result of our researchers' infinite talent and their brilliant work, especially in the United States. Uh, U.S., uh, that is the first country in the world for scientific publications, uh, and in particular in Los Angeles, uh, that has various academic and research institutions, uh, ranked uh, among the first ten in the world. So I'm uh, very happy uh, to celebrate today the launch of the LA chapter of the ISNAF, whose members uh, will delight us with the upcoming panel discussion, the third of a series called uh, Building a Sustainable Future, spanning from computer science of psychology, from biology to medi medical humanities. I really hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, tonight, indeed, is a, a special night because we are very honored to have among our participants one of the two elected officials in uh, North America of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, Honorable Christian Di Sanso. After graduating in Bologna in nuclear and energy engineering, Di Sanso has lived in North America for 17 years, where he arrived as a visiting student at UCLA in his uh, last year of university. Then he remained to pursue a PhD in engineering at uh, uh, UC Berkeley. 
At Berkeley, he was part of the PhD student government and was a founding member of the Italian Society at Berkeley. In 2021, he became president of the Committee of Italian Abroad, the Comites of Houston. And he also helped cr to create the ISNAF West South Central chapter to give concrete support to the Italian researchers in the south of the USA. So thank you very much, Honorable Di Sanzo, for your commitment to strengthening the collaboration between Italian and American research. Your presence here is really very appreciated. So I would like to conclude my, uh, quote, my uh, speech, a brief speech, by quoting the most famous modern scientist, Albert Einstein, who used to say, imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge, is limited to all we know, we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. So let's hope uh, uh, that, that easy, this event will help us imagine a better and brighter future for ISNAF and all Italian researchers in Los Angeles. Enjoy the night. Thank you. Grazie mille Raffaella, and uh, uh, now I would like uh, to call uh, on the stage for his uh, uh, welcome remarks, Honorable Christian Di Sanzio. Di Sanzio. Thank you. Thank you, Consul General. Um, thank you, uh, Emanuele, Director of uh, Italian Culture Institute in Los Angeles. Uh, I'd like to thank also the President of NISNAF, Dr. Uh, Cinzia Zuffada, for organizing today's event. Uh, I'm particularly excited to be here today because it's like coming back here f for me. Uh, I was, uh, I first time I came to the United States was 2005, uh, just as a the visiting student at uh, UCLA, just a few blocks from here. Uh, my apartment was actually on the other side of campus on Gailey, so pretty close from, from here. And I did came to, I came to some events, the Italian Culture Institute, which was already at the time a, a great place of gathering for Italians, and especially for, for some young students was, uh, was a great way to you know, not feel uh, alone in, uh, in, uh, in a new country. So thank you for the, for the work that you're doing here, because I think it's really important for the Italian community. Um, as, uh, as the consul mentioned, I'm a, uh, I'm uh, one of the representatives uh, uh, in the Chamber of Deputies, representing all Italians uh, in North and Central America, so all Italians living in the United States. Uh, I'm also a member of the Environment Committee uh, of the Chamber of Deputies, that's why per today's event is of uh, particular interest to me, so I'm pretty excited to hear from our panelists today. Um, I think it's uh, particularly important that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has established uh, such a day to highlight the contribution of Italian research, uh, its researchers in the world. Uh, I do believe uh, that as the researchers uh, from Italy, we, are, we have been able to achieve great contribution to science uh, in the United States, and there is also quite a story, uh, quite a history of migrations, and as you can remember, some of the scientists, some of the best scientists from Italy actually flew during World War II. Uh, in uh, uh, the United States, and uh, this history sometimes is not as well known in Italy, and it's not and doesn't get the attention that it deserves. So, um, have been here today for me was particularly important to just celebrate the Italian diaspora of scientists, of uh, researchers in the United States, and I want to make sure that I'm able to represent that voice as well, which has not been represented as much in the department. So. Over the next few years, uh, I plan to have more uh, of these opportunities to actually highlight the research contributions from Italians in North America, because I think it's important that we are, uh, we keep this connection with Italy and we keep to building our community here. So I'm pretty excited to see a new chapter of ISNAF uh, here today. ISNAF has actually been the only organization that has been able to uh, have our um, a present in the entire United States. Uh, so, and I think it's in particular that we are able to connect from one city to another in the United States uh, because these help uh, strengthen our community as well as bringing our voices to the institution. So, very excited to see the, uh, the, the council has actually uh, pushed for, for this event to, uh, tonight because it's important that we're able to have 
that good relationship within the institution and the, res and the uh, Italian associations. So we're able to actually uh, highlight some of the contribution as well as some of the needs and some of the contribution that we can give back to Italy, right? So uh, over the next few years, I do plan to be a contributor as well to establish, to help establish new opportunities such as establish programs of exchange between uh, Italy and the United States. There are some programs that could be sponsored by regions, like or some programs that could be sponsored by states, universities. And also like to bring the type of contribution in the Italian parliament to make sure that we're able, uh, as you know, I, I still consider myself a researcher that I haven't done active research for just past eight years, but uh, you know, we're able to bring innovation to Italy to bring that kind of like that the North America feeling and touch that we actually have uh, uh, learned uh, during our uh, presence in the United States uh, and try to, to bring a little bit of that to Italy because I think it's important I think, to have that type of view uh, um, for our representative in the parliament. So I'll try to, to bring the contribution myself and of course uh, the, the help from the entire community of research will be particularly important. So I'm particularly excited to work with all of you uh, over the next few years. So if you have some ideas, please come look for me after the panel. But, uh, and uh, I'll be particularly excited to discuss uh, any, any thoughts you have tonight. So thank you all for having me here today. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, hear from our panelists tonight. Thank you. Disanso, uh, we are really uh, grateful for you being here with us tonight. So to uh, get into the mood of the evening uh, uh, and introduce uh, our panel, I would like to uh, invite uh, to the stage our partners for, the, uh, for this program, the president of ISNAF, Cinzia Zuffada, and the chair of the new, uh, newly born uh, chapter of ISNAF in Los Angeles, Stefano Morellina. Grazie. ISNAP associated with uh, the celebration of the Italian Research Day. Uh, and not only in Los Angeles, there are other ISNAP chapters that in, in the country that are organizing series of events in partnership with the consulate and the Italian uh, Institute of Culture. So uh, this is really a, an achievement for us and uh, I'm particularly pleased because Los Angeles is also a special place. It's one of the places where ISNAF was born original, originally. A few of the founding members were from Los Angeles, and in particular, there were two professors from UCLA who have since passed away. So in a sense, uh, this is a going back to the type of strength in presence that uh, we used to have that I hope we can continue to have moving forward. So with that, without any further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my JPL colleague, uh, Stefano Morellina, who is the chair of the executive committee of the Los Angeles chapter of ISNAP. And yes, Tonight we are, uh, we celebrate the launch of this uh, Los Angeles chapter and the uh, goal of this chapter is to, to accomplish the mission of ISNAF, um, for example, by organizing activities and events to connect the local uh, network of scholars and scientists in LA area and uh, bring into light the work of many researchers from different fields. Um, also important to this chapter will be um, to provide support to the community through mentoring programs and also help uh, Italian researchers who are visiting or coming to the US. Um, some of the executive committees of this chapter are here tonight, so uh, please meet us after this uh, panel discussion. And um, 
You can also visit the ISNAP website if you would like to get involved with these activities or uh, find contacts and information. Uh, and with this, uh, please enjoy this night and welcome with me one of the Excelli committee members of the LA chapter um, and panel moderator for tonight, Dr. Marzio Polito, and professors Pietro Perona, Martin Monti, Matteo Pellegrini, and Massimo Ciavolello. Welcome. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight, and I'm particularly excited because we have a fantastic panel of like uh, very, very accomplished uh, and brilliant scientists and researchers uh, that you know will talk uh, about their work tonight. Um, so first thing first, let's get to know them. Um, so I would like to ask each one of you a question. So this event is, is titled From Genes to Stars. So I want to know each from each one of you, where do you sit between genes and stars? And what are the, uh, what are the questions that you're trying to answer with your research? Uh, we're going to start with Professor Pietro Perona from Caltech, who's, uh, whose research focuses on vision. Uh, so how do we see and how, do we, uh, how we can build machines that see? Okay, thank you, Marzia. So first of all, uh, good evening to everyone. <coughs> um, and so a little bit about myself. So I've been at Caltech since 91, so it's before some of these people were born, I suppose. And, um, uh, and Marzia came to my lab at some point, and so it was uh, very good to get together. Uh, I work on vision, which is understanding how uh, our brain processes images to extract meaning from the images and to inform future actions and how to do the same in, uh, in machines. And as you know, vision works because we have eyes, so we open our eyes and suddenly we see. And, uh, and what happens is there are photons that are bouncing around, they come from the sun or from other sources. They bounce around surfaces in the world and they end up into our pupil, some of them, and they hit a piece of our brain, which is at the back of our eye, it's a retina, and the same they do in your phone, they go through the lens of your phone and they hit a sensor that is at the back of the phone. And it has many pixels, so many sensitive elements, an order of a million, the same is on the back of our retina. And the number of photons and their wavelength that hits these uh, sensors determines a signal, which you can think of as a number, which is how many photons arrive in a given fraction of time which is then either transmitted up to your brain for further computation, or which is transmitted to the CPU or, or the processor of your, of your phone, uh, and with which your phone or the computer in your car or whatever can make use of those images to find out what is out there in the world. And so it's a beautiful sensor because it's passive. It doesn't need to emit any signal in order to work. And it has a lot of resolution. It has a million pixels which over time uh, produce an enormous amount of bits and bytes. And it can discover many properties of what is out there without having to touch things. And so we can um, drive cars, we can play tennis, we can interact socially with our friends and tell if they're paying attention or not, and all of that is possible with vision. Now, how does it work? And it's not easy to even start thinking about how it works and from since we have somebody in literature say that if you, you find traces of people wondering how it works already in, uh, in Lucretius. Uh, and so there is this whole theory of, of uh, skin spilling off of objects and flying through ether into your eye. Um, and of course the theory was wrong, but it was uh, already very interesting that they were thinking about the transport of some information from, from the object we see to us, which is exactly what happens. And, um, and so the question is what computations we carry out in order to be able to extract this meaning. And I will not even try to tell you exactly how it works. Um, it's something that when I was a graduate student in the 80s was a bit of a mystery. And so we we're trying to solve the problem. We knew it could be possible because our visual system works, but we didn't know how to solve it well. So we had lots of theories, ideas. And 
In technology, things changed a lot in the last 10 years, and so thanks to progress in machine learning, we now know how to build systems that do a lot, recognize faces, drive cars, and all of that. And um, so just to show you some examples, we can go to slide number one, and I show you something that my students do. I like, um, I work in fairly fundamental questions, but um, uh, I like to work on applications that um, are useful in some way. So here is an app you can download to your phone that recognizes birds in this case. And so you take photographs and uh, the system will tell you which, which bird it is. And right now it's trained to recognize about um, 10,000 10, species of, uh, of birds. Um, and so this is work of my student Grant Van Horn. Here you have another one. Let's see if I can, oh, sorry. It's going the wrong way, probably. Oh, oh, I can see. Okay, this one is called iNaturalist, and it's, collab it's in collaboration with the, with, um, oh no, wait, this is still, yeah, it's iNaturalist. So this recognizes also insects and uh, plants. It's in collaboration with the California Academy of Science in San Francisco, and you can download these apps to your smartphone, and then you can use them. Maybe some of you have already uh, try them, and if you don't, if you're not sure what to do, just come and see me after the <laughs> the meeting. And so the point is, with the picture that you take of this object, the system is able to decide which one of about fifty thousands of plants and animals uh, it could be, and it tells you where to find more and so on. And so we like to do these things because they promote uh, awareness amongst the population of what they are seeing around them. Um, this is an onla always online system, and so you can move it around on your phone. And as you see, there is a label on top that tells you what you're seeing. And so here, ochre, sea star, for example, you move it around and it tells you different things. Uh, this one works, it's less accurate, but it's so immediate that people like to use it. And the last one is, the first one I showed you was co is called Merlin Bird ID. And there is an option to recognize also the song of the birds. And so we go from vision to audition. And so on top you see the a rep visual representation of the signal that you hear. So you're out in your backyard and you turn it on and you can listen and the system listens with you. And so it tells you which bird you're listening to in this moment. And so, um, and so when it hears a new bird, boom, it pulls it up. And, uh, and so the whole thing is um, going from the senses, from the hearing, from vision, into an interpretation of what is out there. And as you can imagine, for us, vision and audition are the main input channels to, to know the world, and so, um, and so the next stage is artificial intelligence or human intelligence. How does uh, sensory information connect with intelligence, memory, all of that? And so these are all things that are very interesting to us to study. Thank you, Pietro. I've known Pietro for 20 years, and he always tells fascinating things, and so it's amazing research. Um, so we're now go to Professor Martin Monti from UCLA, whose research focuses on neural mechanisms that accompany the loss and recovery of consciousness. I guess uh, first, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I sit pretty close to what you just heard. Um, I'm also interested in the mechanisms uh, of the human brain. Uh, the basic question for me is, uh, thank you. The basic question for me is really, um, how does how does some um, hundred billions of neurons together, um, very physical neurons that you can observe and measure, how do they end up generating the subjective experience that we have? Right now, we're all having a subjective experience of what's going on, and that feels so different than than, than the material neurons that I can look at and and measure uh, in many different ways. And in a sense, there's, there's, there's some mystery to that, to how physical matter gives rise um, to our subjective sense of self and subjective viewpoint, even if I think today there's little doubt that it emerges from the brain. But I wanna do what I want to do uh, this evening is I want to show you an application of this. Well, there are many reasons to study this question. Some are scientific and p entirely scientific and knowledge-based. But I want to give you an example of, of why. So I, I want to tell you a story. And the story starts, um, slightly fictionalized story, but it starts in the UK uh, with a woman who gets into her car 
uh, to go to work, but um, on the way to work, she gets involved in a, in a very um, uh, high-speed um, uh, road traffic accident. And so she gets transported to the hospital, and it takes a couple days for the neurosurgeons um, to, to uh, repair as much damage as possible. And finally, they, they stop keeping her in, um, in an induced coma, and she wakes up, her eyes open up. But something is not quite right. And so they call an expert, um, and the expert's job is to understand if this person is conscious or not. And, and it feels simple to know, each one of you knows, if I asked you to take you less than a millisecond to say, of course I'm conscious. What is much harder for each of you is to point at me or anyone else and say, I am just as confident that, that you have the same consciousness as I do. Because none of us has access to anybody else's subjective sense of feeling. And so, um, and so we might call an expert, let's see, and the expert will look at the patient and we'll do some tests. And I want you to look at this patient very carefully, look at her eyes as carefully as you can. Well, very good, you have to choose now. Is this patient, con you, what you've seen, does this make you believe that the patient is con can, can I actually ask you by, by show of hands, is, this pa is that enough to tell that this person is conscious? Can I ask what your feelings are? Yeah, what's the other equivalent to that hand? Oh, no, no, I just want you to demonstrate with your hands if you think she is conscious. So the hand up, I mean. Hands yeah. up, yes. So, I'm sorry, thank you. Hands up, yes. <laughs> it's a hard question. I'm seeing some hands, others are down. It's a difficult question. So let's try, let's try more. And, and I'm just showing you very standard things that we do in the clinic. So look again, the, the clinician here is going to do something slightly harder, is gonna ask her to follow with her eyes um, this object that she's holding. And, and you have to decide, okay? So look carefully at her eyes. And this happens to us all the time. Many years ago, they, they flew me all the way to Israel to test the, exactly this way, the, the late prime minister, who you might remember after a stroke was left in a coma. And it's very difficult. Can I ask you now, by show of hands, who thinks this person is conscious, given what you've seen? Very hard, right? It's a very difficult question. Um, because the only thing we can do is infer if she's conscious or not. And in, in this case, what we saw was that this person didn't, didn't give any sign that she was conscious. But here's the difficulty. What if she just couldn't move? What if she were conscious, but just couldn't say, hey, Martin, I'm in here, I, I hear you. What if she couldn't do that? It could happen, she's had a, a severe brain injury that, that will impair many aspects of her um, uh, cognition and behavior. And so that's where I got interested in this issue and we ended up com coming up with a, with, a, with a way around that. Maybe somebody can't move their eyes or their fingers or something like that to tell us I'm here. But what they might do is um, they might imagine something. If I asked you to close your eyes and imagine playing tennis, this part of your brain right here will get all really excited, and those colors that you see, that's your brain getting excited. It's just a way that we measure your brain getting excited. And it turns out, I could ask you to imagine something else, and it would be a very different part of your brain, deep down at the bottom of your brain. And so now, and it turns out, some patients, they look as if they were unconscious when we test them in the way that you've seen in the clinic, but then we do this and they can tell us that they are conscious. So simply they couldn't tell us that. And of course, if somebody can put their brain in two states, it's pretty straightforward to hook them up to a computer. We've done this many years ago. You're seeing here my late colleague, Martin Coleman, as he was demonstrating something we were doing. We connected his, his, um, his head to a computer with an electroencephalography system and he's imagining moving his hands to move the cursor up and imagining moving his feet to move the cursor down. And you can imagine how this wouldn't be too hard to then turn it into like a smart home system or something like that. And now I want to show you the last thing I want to show you is, well, this is great and all, but somebody still has to imagine and do things like that, which might not be possible after severe brain injury. Couldn't we just measure the brain and tell this brain is conscious? Turns out there's a, 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 a new technology that is being developed and this is really the work of, of a good friend and collaborator, Marcello Massimini, who's in Milan. We're collaborating on many things. Now we're collaborating on, on this. And the idea is surprisingly simple. Uh, it looks really complicated. It's surprisingly simple. If you wanted to know if something is 
if something, what something is made of. One thing that you, let's say there's a wall and you want to know if the wall is, 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 is full or if it's hollow. What would you do? Some, somebody can tell me. What would you do to, you tap on it, exactly. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to knock on the brain and we're going to listen for the echo. Turns out, some echoes, you only have them if you're conscious. If you're unconscious, you have a very different echo, okay? And, and sorry, I'll get up just because I have to point at it as it happens. So we're going to look on the left, okay? He, we're going to inject, we're going to tap on the brain right here. And you're going to see colors, are the, you think of it as the echo. So we knocked on the brain, and you're going to see this echo that will keep reverberating all through the brain. And on the top left, you see time in milliseconds. And it's reverberating, and it's, it's not only where we, where we knocked. It's going all around the brain. It's, 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 um, it's reverberating throughout the, the brain because when you're con and at, at 260 milliseconds, it's still reverberating. That's because... When you're conscious, your brain is a well-connected network. So the energy, if you knock, it just the echo keeps, uh, keeps reverberating through the system. Now, let's say that somebody is unconscious. Here, let's say, and we're going to do this exact same game. We're going to knock on the brain, inject the energy, and look at what happens. The echo is extremely different. The energy is staying there. It's not going anywhere. It's not in the front and in the back and on the side. It's just there. And in fact, by 200 milliseconds, it's gone. There's nothing else. It's dissipated. And that's because when you're unconscious, your brain is disconnected. Your brain, parts of your brain are not talking to each other quite as much as they were when you were conscious. And so this not only is telling us something very fundamental about uh, how the human brain works, but it's leading to direct advances that we can apply to understand if patients are conscious. Thank you very much, Martin. I, I learned a lot. That was fascinating. Uh, so next we have Professor Matteo Pellegrini, uh, also from UCLA, who's uh, researching the um, his research focus on the development of novel computational approaches to analyze large-scale genomic data. Um, so thank you. So thank you very much. Let me. Oh, oh, go? oh okay. So. What you've heard about so far is that biology obviously is immensely complex and it, it deals with many sort of spatial, temporal aspects of both our organism and our environment. And from the examples you heard before, many of these are sort of uh, you know, short-term um, sort of neighboring uh, connections. So in other words, we're reacting to the world as it changes right away, and uh, on the order of milliseconds, seconds, minutes, uh, something like that. But, you know, and that's, a, of course, an extremely important component of biology. But, of course, biology is not just about these kind of time scales, right? Uh, seconds, minutes, although a lot of molecular biology is studied on that level because that's sort of at the level at which we can observe uh, molecular changes. But there's also other aspects of biology, and so if you think of the other extreme aspect of biology, it's measuring the span, uh, the lifespan of organisms, right? So organisms in biology start off as single cells, and then these cells begin to divide, and then these cells begin to differentiate, and eventually these cells differentiate sort of into their final form and, and the adult form of, a, of an organism. And then most often, in most cases, those organisms then have a limited lifespan, and they start to age, and, and eventually those organisms die. And so obviously in the case of, of humans, that lifespan is very long, right? It can be as long as a century. And so the question is, how do we, in biology, think about events that occur over a century? When we think of centuries, we think of sort of history, right? If we think back, how was the world a century ago? It was a very, very different world, right? So a lot of things happen over the course of a century. And how do we think of that within the context of biology uh, by thinking about it on the molecular scale? So it's a, it's a kind of an, an unusual question, how do we uh, approach it? And one way we can approach it is we can think about DNA. Uh, so DNA, as we all know, is this iconic molecule um, that was discovered uh, in the 50s uh, and 60s. Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. It has this famous uh, double helical structure. And you, you, know, you might think, well, DNA is kind of a, a it's kind of an interesting molecule to look at because, in a way, DNA is invariant, right? The, f the first cell that we all came from contained you know, copies of DNA from your mother and your father. 
And then every cell in your body contains identical copies of that DNA, right? So, and, and that DNA persists throughout our lifetime and is completely unchanging. So we have this sort of set of instructions that are unchanging, permanent, and they're the same in every cell and they're the same throughout time. So that's sort of the opposite end of, of, the, of the spectrum. It's sort of this molecule that's completely invariant. So how do we connect all these things? How do we connect sort of a century of biological lifespan change with this invariant molecule? And that brings us to the science of epigenetics, which you know, is, is something less known. We all know about genetics. We've probably all you know, interacted with genetics directly through things like 23andMe and, and other kind of companies that give us genetic information. But genetics is only part of it. It turns out that the DNA molecules are not as invariant as we think. So the sequence of DNA, the instruction manual that we're given at birth, persists invariant, but it gets modified. So there are molecular changes that occur to the DNA. Uh, in this case, it's a molecular change that we call methylation. So it's the addition of atoms to methylation. So an analogy would be, suppose, you know, we all have the same book, and we're all reading the same book, but, but we're modifying the book as we, as we, with time. Maybe we're ripping out pages, we're writing on the book, we're erasing certain parts. Maybe by the end, that book is very different, right? If you read the book that somebody has next to you, after, you know, decades of sort of like happened in the Middle Ages when people <laughs> were, were copying books by hand, maybe books evolve, they change, right? And so even though the, the initial book is the same, the way it gets read by each one of your cells changes, and that explains why, you know, cells in your body are different, right? The neurons and blood they have the same DNA, but they're very different. That's because they're reading the DNA in a different way. And similarly, what we've discovered is that the, the differences in, in the way the DNA is read are not just a matter of, of cells and parts of your body, but they also happen with time. And that's what this picture shows. So this is one single molecule, one single position within your DNA, um, a position we call a cytosine, and this is the age of an individual. So it starts off at birth on the left, and it goes to 110 years. This particular uh, individual in the study was 110 years old. And you can see that the changes in this methylation of DNA at this one specific position completely tracks the lifespan of, of obviously it's not the same individual that was measured uh, you know, throughout 100 years, but it was an ensemble of individuals such as you might have in this room that are all different ages. And when we measure the methylation of that one position in their DNA, it changes and tracks their, um, uh, their, their age. And so what this tells us then is that we can observe within biology molecular changes that are occurring over a century and that track the lifespan and are probably related to the fact that you know, while our cells are changing, again, across our body, they're also changing with time. And what we think specifically is happening is that uh, our body has special kinds of cells that we refer to as stem cells that sort of persist and give, you know, give rise to cells as, as cells die and are regenerated. And so these stem cells, uh, as the original cells that are able to produce all these different cells, are also themselves changing with time. And this is sort of one very, very clear manifestation of these changes and also explains partially why as we age, our regenerative capacity changes, right? These stem, the capacity of these stem cells to regenerate tissues changes. And so that brings us to the last part, which is sort of this notion of, you know, the fountain of youth, right? We've always been searching for a fountain of youth. We know we age. It's, it's a sort of inevitable um, biological process that happens to all of us. So there's a lot of interest now in, you know, can we slow it down? Can we stop it? Can we reverse it, right? And so if we understand the molecular changes that are occurring to DNA and, and other molecules in our body as we age, maybe we can interfere, we can add, we develop drugs, we can develop some kind of intervention that changes this. And in, uh, in uh, th there's, there's sort of a large industry that's emerged around this field, and a lot of this is, is based on some observations that were made around a decade ago that you could actually take um, you know, cells that were differentiated and add special factors that exist naturally in these cells and convert them back to stem cells. 
So this process of stem cells differentiating into other kinds of cells can be reversed, and can, you can make it go the other way. And so the idea then in the field is can we take um, uh, aging mice, uh, most of the work is done in mice, add these special factors that have this strange name, OSKM, but they're basically factors that can take these older cells and revert them back into these stem cells and turn the mice back into young mice. And so there's, obviously this is very futuristic, uh, but surprisingly there's a lot of, you know, very exciting research in this field that's showing maybe there is some capability to do this, at least partially. And so this, the ultimately the idea is if we can understand these molecular changes that are occurring to DNA and other molecules, then we will have a better uh, idea of how to intervene and, and reverse them and return the regenerative capacity of our stem cells to the state they were earlier in life. Thank you, Raphael. It's great. You keep us for forever young. <laughs> Very happy <laughs> about that. <laughs> Let's go to Professor uh, Massimo Ciavolella from UCLA, whose research focuses on medical humanities and Renaissance Italian theater. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here. And uh, Matteo, you know, keep me posted about, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is going on. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, since I come from uh, the field of literature, uh, I don't have any images. Uh, you know, I could have brought images of a few covers of books, uh, novels, uh, but at the end I don't. I, I, I decided not to. I'm interested uh, in uh, two main fields. I, I started uh, as a specialist in medieval Italian literature, uh, and therefore Dante, Boccaccio, Petrarca, all the way up to the 17th century. But then I became very much interested in medical humanities, uh, not uh, seen as it is seen from the medical profession, that is to say medical ethics, uh, the relationship between patient and uh, <coughs> doctor, but uh, as the interaction between medicine and visual and non-visual arts. I mean, we don't, sometimes we don't realize that, uh, uh, for example, m one of the great themes uh, of contemporary novels, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century novel, is disease, of course, uh, you know? And it teaches uh, something about uh, you know, the way in which uh, you know, we deal and we face disease. On the other hand, it also teaches people in medicine, of course, uh, to look at it from a different uh, perspective. So um, over the years, uh, I became interested in the development of certain ideas. For example, you know, why one of the great themes of Western literature is uh, love as a disease. what it can be called, you know, the diseases of love, you know, which are connected, of course, with another big problem, that of melancholy, you know, and that of depression. And when we look at it, we realize that it began with uh, the Hebrew Bible, and it went all the way through to contemporary literature in general. You know, if you go on the internet and you look, love is a disease, you will never end reading uh, you know, what you can find. Um, and then the other great love of my life, of course, was uh, and is uh, Dante. And we go back to the stars uh, through Dante, of course, uh, <coughs> you know, the theme of this, uh, of this evening. Now, one of the things, though, that I would like to stress uh, is that this is not a great moment uh, for literature. We are going through a moment of crisis. Literature, books, in fact, and in literature I mean readings, uh, are very much under attack. We've seen it in the last few years, uh, even in this country, but not only in this country. It is not uh, a new thing. You remember, or you remember, you know, some of you may recall that uh, in 1497, a Dominican priest, uh, Giacomo Savonarola, who was a a, a, a priest from uh, Ferrara who had gone to call to, to uh, uh, Florence uh, asked some of uh, his 
followers to go through Florence to gather um, uh, gambling tables, uh, um, playing cards, uh, scandalous paintings, uh, and especially books. Uh, Savonarola hated, among, um, among all the books, he hated uh, uh, The Cameron by Boccaccio the most. In fact, you know, he, he, he found it lewd, and it was one of the books that, uh, together with all these, uh, <coughs> with all these other items, uh, were burnt uh, in the Piazza della Signoria in Florence, uh, 1497. Now, you may recall that the year after Savonarola was burnt <laughs> in the Piazza della Signoria, <laughs> of course, uh, first he was hanged and then he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, burnt together with two of his followers. Uh, he was in the middle and the other two, you know, symbolic, uh, clearly, you know? Mm. But we may also recall that in 1933, students uh, from uh, 35 German universities uh, collected 25,000 books which were deemed uh, pernicious uh, to the cause of uh, the Nazi party and they were burnt. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the night uh, of the burning of the books of Sonarola, you remember, was called, uh, was called uh, um, the, um, uh, Il Falò delle Vanità, you know? the, the, um, uh, the Bonfire of the Vanities. That, you know, there was a movie, of course, uh, with Tom Hanks and uh, uh, Mary Griffith, uh, and there was a book uh, by Tom Wolfe uh, called uh, the, the, the for some reason, the falò, let's call it in Italian, okay? <laughs> Il falò delle vanità, since it comes from uh, Italy. <clears throat> so, in a way, what uh, I feel I do, my, my, my work, my job is supposed to do, is to bring back uh, a understanding of why literature is so important uh, today. You know? It is important uh, for, for many, many reasons. Uh, it is important, of course, because it stimulates, for example, imagination, because it speaks uh, to our subconscious, because uh, when I read, uh, I am at the same time uh, all those characters that I read about uh, while I remain myself. And this is uh, a fundamental part uh, of knowledge. No. And I cannot believe, and I will not believe, that there can be knowledge without reading. And I don't mean just reading so-called high literature. I mean reading. No. One, of, uh, one of my best friends, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago, an eminent philosopher, Remo Baudet, uh, was a great reader like me, of thrillers uh, and of science fiction. But, you know, and so we would exchange books. And every time he gave me a book and I read it, uh, I could see all his notes uh, you know, on the book itself. You know? And it was uh, a way of trying to bring that idea, that sentence, uh, into his own context, of course. So um, let me just read uh, a quote uh, from, uh, from C.S. Lewis. You remember C.S. Lewis, uh, the great uh, uh, English essayist, uh, uh, novelist, uh, also lay theologian. He was, of course, uh, the author <coughs> of uh, The Allegory of Love and of the seven novels uh, that put together constitute uh, the Chronicle of Narnia. No? very famous, of course. That's what he says. But in reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. Like the night sky in the Greek poem, I see with myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, 
I transcend myself. I am never more myself than when I do. The fact is, and if I may read this last paragraph, that in great, the great books of literature and great historical works, such as the Bible, the Indian epic poems, Homer Iliad, or the Odyssey, Virgil Aeneid, Boccaccio's, of course, the canon, Dante's Divine Comedy, Don Quixote by, <coughs> of course, uh, Cervantes, uh, and I could go on and on for the rest of the evening, bring to society the inspiring principles of life. Literature adds to reality. It does not simply describe it. It enriches the necessary competencies that daily life requires and provides. And in that respect, it irrigates the deserts at times that our life become. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that was very inspiring. Also brought me back home, I'm from Florence, so it was nice. To <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions and then please stop me when we're going over time because I don't have <laughs> a, a clear timing here. Um, so um, I if you read an Oxford dictionary, research is the systematic investigation into a study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusion. So in the, in the modern world, like materials and sources are becoming more and more easily available. So this has probably changed your research, um, even in the last decade. I know Pietro, I know mentioned that a little bit before. Um, does anybody wanna uh, expand on like how things have changed in your field of research in the last 10 years? I can say a few things maybe. So, um, so as you know, Marcia, so Marcia is also a little bit in artificial intelligence, and machine learning especially. And so as we attempt to build machines that are a bit smarter than they used to be, um, we make an enormous use of data. And, um, and so we bring to life huge collections of data of various kinds of texts or images of stars and earth and so on. Uh, and conversely, what they see is that um, as machines become better at filtering data and understanding what is in the data, uh, they empower scientists to see more of what is available. So when I came to Caltech, JPL had just had a mission, which I think was Magellan mission to image, maybe Cinzia remembers, to image the whole of Venus at very high resolution. And we're really happy. Magellan. And, sorry? Magellan. Magellan, yes. And so they had stacks of what was then CDs or DVDs full of images and they showed me proudly. And then um, the next phone call I get is, oh, we didn't realize that uh, not even if we hired a thousand people for a thousand years, there would be enough eyes to look at all of these pictures and figure out where are the volcanoes, where are the, the channels or whatever. And, um, and so they asked me to help them to build vision systems to annotate the data and help them uh, screen off Anyway, so, so we're building lots of instruments now that gives us an enormous amount of images and signals of all sorts from the brains and from uh, cells and metab metabolomics and this and that. And um, only through machines we can filter them and help scientists come to touch or uh, consider the data and, uh, and develop new theories. And so there is th that's what I see. Thank you. Martin? Well, um, definitely uh, research in neuroscience has been revolutionized by data accessibility. Um, uh, some of the most ambitious projects today in neuroscience are about measuring hundreds and, and eventually thousands of people. And the most interesting thing is that this has been paired, so there's sort of a two aspects. Very large pr uh, projects where we sample large populations. And the second is that today, for the most part, we all put our data 
anonymized and sort of um, so to protect the identity of, of the participants who give these data online in specific neuroscience repositories. And I'll give you an example of how this changed completely research. Usually, if I wanted to answer a question, I would come up with my little experiment. I would find 10 people that I could bring to the lab, put inside an MRI machine, try the little game you've so seen earlier where they imagine playing tennis, and that would be it. Um, not more than a month ago, I had a new idea, and I wanted to test it out. It took me about 10 minutes to go online on a NIH, which is the National Institute of Health repository, to download about 500 images, which allowed me to test an idea within you know, the time it took me to process them. And so this, this means scientifically a revolution. Data are so available that our ideas are no longer constrained by needing to always acquire new data to answer scientific questions. And this has changed, the accessibility is democratizing in many ways the study of neuroscience um, across the world, because people with brilliant ideas can just download data if it fits what they want to ask. Uh, this seems to me the most beautiful revolution because it's bringing in just so many more talented people to answer questions. Thank you. Matteo or Massimo, any? In the case of DNA, yeah, I mean the, the ability to acquire data has grown incredibly. Um, if you think back in uh, 2001, uh, you know, uh, President Clinton back then introduced the, the human genome, um, which was sort of this crowning achievement of humanity. It was this effort that you know was an international effort that spanned over a decade, um, billions of dollars. It was a massive sort of international achievement. And uh, um, nowadays, you can order your genome for $200. <laughs> so it's, you know, two decades have made a world of difference, right? We've gone from sort of many, many orders of magnitude in, in terms of our ability to collect data. And you know, it's a blessing and a curse because um, you know, a, as the data becomes so overwhelming, we rely on machines to interpret the data because obviously a human, you know, as a human, you can't take you know, billions of, of sequences and make any sense of it. And, and so the, the, the blessing is that we have this capacity to measure uh, DNA across populations, across, as I mentioned, across our body, across time. Uh, and so there's sort of this infinite potential to measure. And, and the curse is that you know, making sense of this is extremely difficult. And so we rely on very, very sophisticated, you know, machines to, to do all this, and we spend a lot of our day trying to think up, you know, new ways to interpret this data. But, you know, at the end of the day, though, you know, the only way you can make sense of it is to go back to the beginning and say, you know, humans think about science and, and data and, and our reality in terms of stories, right? So it's, it's all about, which is, which is sort of, you know, the, the difficult aspect of science is how do you convert this seemingly infinite amount of information into a story that's comprehensible and that you can communicate to people. And so, you know, it, in a way, it's a, that's why I say it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. A curse because making those stories gets harder and harder as the, the data that we collect becomes less and less sort of, you know, uh, accessible, interpretable, manageable. Um, but yet, you know, uh, the stories keep coming and, and they keep progressing and, and so science advances nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I was at the University of Toronto, that's where I taught for 10 years, and a friend of mine was working on uh, a particular concept uh, in the works of the Greek Roman physician Galen. Now, the works of Galen have been published in 45 volumes, uh, and what he was doing was going through every page of every volume, uh, trying to find uh, the way in which this particular idea developed. It took him about a year and a half. Uh, just at that time, uh, the CD-ROM containing all of Greek literature came out. <laughs> it came out from California, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you know, that's where it was put together. And, you know, Suddenly, in a day or two, he was able to finish what would have taken him probably another year. That's what has happened in my field. Today, you can find just about anything you want online, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time, 
because it was very nice to go to the Archegymnasio in Bologna, to the, to the Laurentiana, Medicio Laurentiana in Florence, uh, or the National Library and spend days or weeks uh, over there. You know? Now we don't have the excuse uh, anymore for doing that. <coughs> Perhaps uh, with the exception of uh, when you work on a manuscript and then you may want to go and touch it because there is something more than, simple, than simply the pleasure or the capacity of reading it. So, Thank you. Let's, uh, let's shift gears then and then let's look at the future. Like how are things going to change in the next 10 years? I'm going to start with Massimo. We're going to ask all of our uh, literature questions to chat GPT or something like that in the future or... <laughs> What, what else is in the future for the research in, in the Europe? In the future of the research, uh, um, I'm doing something. But, you know, when I say these things, people look at me uh, with uh, an air of skepticism and, uh, you know, probably thinking, well, what is he talking about? I'm doing a dictionary of aphrodisiacs right now. Fantastic. <laughs> Matteo, what's in the future for your research? Okay, the future, well, I mean, I think the, you know, the um, humanity is going to expend an enormous amount of effort, time, and, and capital in this quest for uh, non-aging <laughs> or reversal of aging. So it's inevitable, right? Because as, as all of us age, uh, our the importance we give to the process increases, and so the investment of our own personal effort and our willingness to invest in other people's effort in doing this will increase. And so I think you know, how much progress we will make remains an open question, and I, I can't predict that, but I, I can predict that the amount of effort that we're gonna put <laughs> into the process is gonna grow exponentially. And I'm sure the two things, will, you know, there will also be progress uh, along with that effort. Thank you. Um, well, I have a hope. <clears throat> I'm not sure that it will happen, but my, my hope is a solution. I think you hear often um, discussions of other fields where there's crisis, uh, like physics is one where they're debating if they're a crisis or not. Neuroscience, particularly neuroscience of consciousness, has been in crisis ever since because of what I alluded to earlier. Just how is it that a, a, piece, of, a, a piece of flesh that I can measure, that sends impulses that I can see and I can measure in a million ways. I could show you, I could spend a whole evening show you pi showing you pictures of how brains behave and how we've measured them when they lose consciousness. So when you fall asleep in the evening, uh, what happens when you wake up in the morning, um, uh, you know, why do you dream suddenly in the middle of the night? You're conscious again, even though you're sleeping. Why? why? We, we measured the brain in all of these ways. We've measured what happens when we are conscious and we're not conscious. But we have not answered the question of why is it that I have, the only thing, I, there's nothing else in this world, from my point of view, but me having a feeling of everything I'm seeing right now, everything you're seeing right now, it's just how your consciousness is seeing the world. The world outside might be different than how you and I perceive it. But the only thing we have is this consciousness. How does this piece of meat, objective that I can measure, ions, proteins, turn into this feeling that we all have. There's still, despite you know, at least 100 years of sort of modern, let's call it neuroscience, no answer. And that's our crisis. I, my wish is that we solve it. Great, Pietro? Uh, okay, so in my field has had made lots of progress in the last 10 years, and uh, we know about it, so people ask about mentioning ChatGPT, which is in front of everybody, and I see how things are working well. So we don't know if we are um, in the process of understanding how to build artificial intelligence and understanding human intelligence, which mm -hmm. is the question that you're asking. That we don't know, but of course there is an enormous amount of progress, so we are hopeful, and so it goes a bit like fits and starts, so depending on which year you ask me, I'm more or less optimistic. Now, the <coughs> so there is you know, one hope and one challenge. So one hope is, I'm remembering my grandmother used to tell me, oh, you're very lucky because you're young, and by the time you're my age, there will be a little robot that you tell it, bust the table, wash the dishes, and, it's, and so you will have lots of time for reading and doing whatever you like. 
and so you know, one hope is that um, we can make human life um, lighter, more meaningful, um, and um, relieve people from dangers, from uh, menial work that maybe we don't enjoy doing, and if we can focus on the things we like best, and we can see a human flourishing, and in part, you know, we can see that, that there is human flourishing. Now, the people tend to worry about, a little bit, about artificial intelligence, and they worry more about human stupidity, if you will, um, natural stupidity, and um, so I'm glad we have politicians and diplomats tonight, and we can ask them how to deal with that, which, of course, is something I don't know anything about. Thank you very much. So if we have time, I would like to open if there's any question from the public here, if anybody from the audience wants to as ask a question. Yes. I see. Thank you. Uh, the microphone is coming. Just one second. Thank you. Uh, since the topic is from genes to stars and universe, uh, this is a question for the mm, neurophysiologist. Um, the consciousness uh, happens in some people who have brain injury and all of a sudden they feel one with the universe. It seems to be a different type of consciousness, awareness. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. A very interesting question. Let me... Let me address it slightly differently. So we all have a sense of what it means to be less conscious than what we are right now. I mean, we might have put to sleep someone, maybe, but everybody else is at their best right now. It's been a long day and it's evening. Um, so this is what we are usually. And we all have a, an intuition for what it means when we kind of get more tired. Maybe we are sitting on a couch watching TV and sort of our, our thoughts are, becoming a little muddy and, 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 we, and we slowly fade into unconsciousness. Right? We, we, so we understand what it means to have that gradation downwards. It's difficult to understand what it means to have any gradation above what you currently have. Typically, once you get to where we are today, what we consider is not that we are more conscious in, 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 the, in, in states such as what you mentioned, is that we are differently conscious. So Often it's easy to think of consciousness uh, as, as a stick of how conscious you are. And then once you're at the top, you can be conscious in many different ways. And it's actually not difficult to manipulate somebody's brain, to, to, to inject a little bit of energy into somebody's brain in specific parts and, and give them these, uh, um, these experiences. One example, um, people often have what we call out-of-body experiences. Some people have them in the context of very dangerous situations, and then we call them near-death experiences. And they feel like they are not in there. Suddenly, their body is here, and they feel like they're up here. It's actually not difficult to buzz somebody's brain in, in just the right place, which is in the parietal lobe, sort of the posterior part of our brains, and recreate that sensation. If you came to the lab, I could zap your brain with el an electric mag magnetic pulse, and suddenly you would feel outside of your body. So. Um, it's all about how the brain functions that will give you a different experience. And you can alter that in many ways. Probably alcohol is, is one that is fairly familiar. Um, and there are many ways of m allowing the brain to process differently what's happening. Maybe one more question there? Uh, yes, I have one for the same professor. So you said you were sort of struggling with or you know passionate about figuring out this question of what is it that actually animates matter. So you're saying, you know, what, what actually gives life or what, what essentially is animating this matter. Do you think it's a matter of um, not having the right tools to understand that now? Or do you think that at this point it's something that we'll never understand? What, what a wonderful question. So um, I'm asking a parallel question, but the question I'm, I'm asking is really analogous to the question, what's the difference between live matter and non-live matter? Right? How does life emerge? And in the same way, you can ask, what's the difference between matter that is life and conscious and matter that is conscious? And the, the truth is that, so one way to see it is exactly what you said. That's just beyond us. And it's not difficult to conceive. Um, if you imagine 
if you imagine the world in, in there's a beautiful book called Flatland. If you imagine the world that were in 2D, it would be very difficult to understand why some things happen, right? Some things would appear like magic. So we do, some people think we'll just never understand it. It's as if we were, you know, our dimensions don't allow us to understand that. Some people would say that it's a non-issue. There's no such thing as a difference between your subjective self and your brain. That's what your brain does. The brain gives you your subjective self. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. So there's a, it, the fee might feel different, but they are, they are, they are one and the same. In fact, one uh, very appealing answer to this problem is that it's just two different ways of talking about the same thing. They're epistemologically different, so it's different descriptions of uh, how our brain works, but ontologically they are exactly the same thing. So their nature of, conscious, of, of, of consciousness and brain is the same, they're just different levels of talking about the same thing, much like in other fields, um, some, par some things might behave like waves and particles at the same time. So that's one possible answer. One of these is right. Thank you. Maybe one more. Any question for another panelist, maybe? Um, I actually had a question about the consciousness again. So, <laughs> but it, it's an open-ended question. I'm, I work into tech, but I'm also working in the consciousness department. <laughs> So uh, my question is open-ended in the sense that I wanted to understand if our consciousness is more receptive towards auditory vibrations, uh, like music, for example. Uh, for example, Beethoven went deaf at the peak of his career, and after that, they say he made better music. What was it that allowed him to make it even when he couldn't hear it to his own music or listen to it? Uh, is there a connection here, is the question. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer the last part of the question. Um, uh, I would imagine that when somebody is so profoundly skilled at something, uh, not having the feedback of music wouldn't impair the ability to understand um, the relationship between different uh, frequencies and how they can be pleasurable. Um, but there is a very interesting point about music having a very strong effect on the brain. Uh, if you take a scan, uh, a functional MRI of somebody while they're listening to music, it really looks like the whole brain is reacting to it. And, and this might be explained by your subjective experience. Uh, music is, you know, A, pleasurable, it's, a, it's an auditory sound, it, it triggers emotions, it has many uh, facets to it that engage many different parts of the human brain as opposed to things, other things that we do that only engage some sort of subsets. So s there's no doubt that our brain really, really likes music uh, and connects deeply to us via emotions and that sort of thing, yes. Thank you. There were uh, someone who wanted to ask a question over there. I was curious to if you could expand a little bit uh, or, or kind of this debate among each other. Um, from data to information and from information to understanding and interpreting, how do you see it from a literal standpoint and from a, um, even a genetic <laughs> standpoint? <laughs> but, uh, you know, how many of you, uh, do you speak about, do you define it the same? And do you see, because um, I'm wondering if information is, and if AI, for instance, uh, is able to process and manage and filter a lot of data, and we receive that data, and many of you mentioned, you know, how we can do th things faster, and we can, you know, access more information. But what's the future in this case, and do you agree upon a definition of what brings that information into, I want to say knowledge for lack of better word. Thank you. So maybe I'll start, and then, but I'm very curious to hear what other people have to say. <coughs> So if you look at how our senses work, uh, you could say that um, we were talking about music a moment ago. So you could register the oscillations of air on a microphone and you translate them into an electrical signal. So I would call that data in the sense that it's a physical uh, phenomenon and you convert it into another physical phenomenon to make it more accessible to a computer. You can sample it and transform it into numbers. And so far the nature 
uh, physical nature has changed, but if you could go back uh, from this sequence of numbers, which is representing the music of Beethoven, and through a speaker, you produce again, right? So <coughs> there we're talking about data, and it's still the same. Um, now there is some engineering behind it, which we could get into, but it, we're still at the same level. Now, um, I could come into this room, and the first thing I do when I enter a room, my brain wants to know if there are other people, for example, and my eyes scan the room immediately, and I know if there is somebody else. It's very, very quick. Uh, so I become aware of this person. And I would call that information, because the data could have been photons coming into my eyes, or it could be a dark room like this one, but they might hear somebody moving, turning the page of a book. Um, and then from completely different sources of data, I would come up with a piece of information, which is there is a human being, it's at a certain distance, they may have a certain disposition towards me and make up a story about what is out there. And so this information that allows me to react, defend myself if that person is about to attack me or greet them if it's a friend. And so they allow me to respond in adequate ways and to decide what's going to be happening in the next minute or so. So what happened in between is I built a theory of what the world is like, at least what the world is like around me. And so I converted that raw data, which was the signal, into a whole theory that allows me to make predictions. And based on these predictions, I can take action and change the world in ways that are favorable to me, in a certain sense. Now you can take this description, lift it into the whole of science, where you start from observations, and then you build theories. And the theories are there because they, in some sense, explain why the data was there, the phenomena of the world and they allow you to interact with the world in a more successful way. And so this is how I will discuss it, but uh, I'm curious to hear. Yeah, okay. uh, well, I, I, you know, that's, yeah, it's a very <laughs> complicated question that I don't know anybody, but, uh, you know, one example is physics, right? I mean, physicists have been remarkably successful in that path that you just described, right? So physicists have been collecting data in the form of, you know, if we're talking about sort of atomic particle physics, they've been collecting data for, for decades, centuries, very, very complex data sets. And these data sets have now required computers to be able to convert, you know, the data into information. But the physicists have been remarkably successful in generating theories that, you know, as, as we just heard, that explain this, this data and this information. And some of these theories are beautifully simple, right? Um, and they're incredibly robust, right? They are able to describe all of this data that's generated with remarkable precision to the point where if there's any deviation between the theory and the data, that's a Nobel Prize in physics, right? So <laughs> that's kind of one remarkable extreme of human achievement where we've been able to do that. In other fields, we haven't been as successful, such as in biology, because the, the data and the information is, is more complex, right? So it's a level of complexity that even despite the fact that the physics data is enormously complex, the biological one is, is you know, much, much orders of magnitude more complex. And so when we start to try to build understanding and theories in biology, they often, you know, to make, to account for all the data, these, these understanding becomes so complex that it's, it's itself, it doesn't, isn't satisfying, you know, it just becomes this enormously complicated description of many, many parts that are interacting. And so that's the challenge of, of other fields that are more complex than physics and not just biology and physics and many other fields as well. And that's where, you know, kind of the, the occasionally there are these beautiful insights that help us simplify this data and understanding, and even though maybe it doesn't describe everything we see, it gives us some intuition, some simpler way of looking at the world that is extremely useful in terms of where do we go from there, how do we collect more data, how do we collect more understanding. So it, that's the challenge of you know, complex science. Thank you very much. I, I see our council has a <laughs> comment or question. No, uh, since I am a diplomat and uh, I have a more political and uh, probably easier question for you as a final question, 
So my, my question concerns the, the title of our day, so the Italian Research Day and how Italian research is explored human beings. So my question is, do you think that there is, uh, that there is uh, as the Consul General of Italy, a, a specific Italian, a, a specific contribution that you as Italian research give to your uh, researches, your studies? So can we say that there is something uh, very special that you as Italians, because of your I don't know, particularly the studies you have done uh, in Italy, the, the uh, uh, education you had uh, in Italy uh, gave uh, uh, to your, uh, the contributions you can give to your studies and researches. Uh, I feel that, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. Um, it's the broadness of the point of view. Um, I, I do feel lucky, I mean, maybe my field, I mean, studying consciousness and neuroscience, the pretty it's a very encompassing question that requires reading many fields from philosophy to psychology to neuroscience, et cetera. Uh, but I do feel like that allows me to look at the question and appreciate many different aspects of it. Um, of course, there are wonderful people in every, from every country that can do that. But certainly, um, I, I often notice the difference between sort of this more open and more classical maybe training compared to the very specialized and slightly narrower approach that's uh, a majority, I'll say, of my colleagues uh, often uh, show. And I feel very fortunate to, I've shown one question today, but there are many questions that border law, for example, and ethics that I pursue in my work. And I think it, it is in part because of the background that has taught me to look at sort of a, a large picture. Yeah, I would answer the same way. I'm sorry, I attended the show classically, and I figured this out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <we, laughs> so I did translate to Cretius, and I remember <laughs> his theory. Anyway, so, yeah, so I, I guess growing up in an old country, you can sometimes, so, you know, the, uh, adding a little bit to what you said, but uh, which is all true, uh, you also things, uh, put things in, perspe in historical perspective more easily, because things have happened before. And so often when, so I'm in, again, in AI, there are all of these questions that come up about, um, uh, you know, will this whole thing blow up out of proportion? Um, wh what is human dignity and this and that? And then, you know, so it can go back to, you know, technologies were introduced before, like what happened when we introduced the printing press? You know, and, and so to me it's like yesterday because I, I've, I've lived through it in my high school, but to people here they don't even think about it. And so you can see, okay, people reacted in a certain way. They had to regulate the use. There, there were lots of book burning at some point because they were worried. And ideas started to become viral more, more quickly and people had to deal with that. And they, they had to deal with the question of truth and that's in part why science came up because it was a system to establish what is true and what is false. And it's not immediate. It takes a lot of effort and time and you've got to have a community that uh, comes together around some principles and so I'm thinking, well, you know, today with the social media, people don't know what the truth is any longer, and things go around virally, and you have to regulate it. Well, it's similar, so I can see how things um, go along the same pattern, and so I, at least I'm not so lost, and, and I feel like, okay, we will solve it in some way, and we can look, so that's an additional perspective. I mean, I have exactly the same answer. I mean, maybe the, the, the Italian perspective is, is the historical one. And, and, and so you have a tangible, when you go to Italy, you, you can touch history in a way that you can't in Los Angeles and much of America, right? You touch, you know, buildings that have been around for 2,000 years. You see things that have, you know, have, have taken, were made centuries before. And so your sense of time is different, right? It's you have this longer, more vast sense of time. And, and, and in scientific thinking, maybe that helps you think of science as something that's evolving over time. It's not, you know, it's not what we learn in school. It's not a textbook, you know, that's, that's fixed and here's the knowledge, you know, read the textbook, you know science. No, it's, it's a history, right? We should really teach science the way we teach history because it's a con constantly evolving set of ideas you know, that the ideas are generally correct. It's not like we're saying the science before was incorrect, but we're adding, you know, nuances, new information, new ways of thinking. So it's that evolutionary view of, of you know, the tangible history that is then 
we then bring to science and changes the way maybe we do science, or at least we will perceive science. So. Well, <coughs> over the years, uh, until a very short time ago anyway, um, Italian literary culture, and I'm not talking about the great novelists or poets, I'm talking about uh, mainly academic uh, you know, culture, was very much restricted uh, to Italy. There wasn't uh, a global view. What uh, Italy gave uh, to, the rest of the, to the rest of the Western world uh, during the 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, what we call Renaissance, uh, of course, uh, was almost forgotten. It was uh, closed uh, in, uh, and uh, Italian literary criticism, for example, just looked at other Italian literary criticism. Uh, also, the, the, the system of the universities, of course, uh, of the so-called concorsi, all kinds of problems. What we did in North America was open up to a global view of culture to contextualize uh, Italian culture within uh, a European medium uh, and uh, trying to show how Italian culture, even in those moments uh, when, uh, you know, before it was thought that Italian culture did not have an imprint, uh, did not have importance. I'm thinking about the 17th century, I'm thinking about the 18th century, Enlightenment, Baroque Enlightenment. Even in those moments, in fact, uh, Italian culture was fundamental within a European context. The other thing is, uh, you know, my interest, as I said, in the last few years has been mainly in medical humanities. Uh, medical humanities, the way in which we interpret uh, people coming from literature, uh, medical humanities, uh, has also started in Italy. And it has started because of some of us working within the field of Italian studies, in fact. You know. And as such, you know, we are fairly proud <laughs> of what we have taken and given, and not just what we have received. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic conversation. I want to thank you very much, our panelists, for being here tonight. I want to thank ISNAP, the Cultural Institute, the Consul General, our organizer, our authorities, and uh, all the audience for being here tonight and, uh, and talking with us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you.